First of all, thank you uh, for the warm welcome and the introduction. This is our first time in Norway for our Canadian delegation. And uh, I think we only have one person who's been to Norway before. And you have an absolutely beautiful country. Um, not only is it very much like Canada and where I grew up with the wilderness, but people are much nicer than in Canada. <laughs> and you have beer and hockey. Everywhere I look, beer and hockey. But the geography, the climate, um, many of our values are very similar. And I think that makes it a very easy place to begin some of our international work with you and also um, to have an opportunity to share with you some of what's happening with our principals and our school leaders in Canada. So this presentation is about school leadership and creating a great school for all. All students, all parents, all teachers, and all principals. How do we do that? It's a very complex thing. And at the very bottom of this first slide, there's a quote by John Muir, who's the founder of the Sierra Foundation. He's a conservationist in North America that's very well known. And he says, when we try to pick anything else, when we try to pick anything out by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. In other words, there's no easy answer. There's no one thing that creates a great school for all students. It's a very complex, difficult thing, and it's connected to everything else. Their home background, socioeconomics, the economy, um, climate, the environment, so many different things. So I put that up front because there is no great easy answer. We're all discovering in this new digital world how we can create great schools for all students. And can you understand me okay? I'm speaking slow enough? Good, okay. Because if not, throw something at me. <laughs> so I want to give you just a quick background about my life. This is um, when I grew up in Alberta. I grew up on a ranch. So I'm, I'm six generations in Alberta. And in Al I know in Norway, that's like a newcomer, right? <laughs> Um, but in Alberta, that's one of the oldest families. We have an old family ranch right in the Rocky Mountains. And although it looks like I was raised by wolves, um, I show this picture because I grew up living on a place where I always wanted to see what was over the next hill. I always wanted to know what the next thing was that was happening. And that has led me so much throughout my professional career and uh, doing my PhD and a lot of my research. So what I'm sharing with you in this presentation and then the presentation at lunch is really about what I see over the hill, what things are coming, and how we, as a profession, profession of teaching and school leaders, how we can meet those challenges uh, head on. I was a teacher at a reservation um, for five years, and that was the beginning of my teaching career. So I was 20 years old when I had my Bachelor of Education degree, and I started teaching on the Blood Reservation, it was called, with the Kainai people. And they're, they're one of our uh, traditional Aboriginal groups, First Nations groups. And this is when I was being named. And they called me Apapum, which means lightning. So at the end of this presentation, you'll know why. <laughs> but it was a very, very interesting experience for me because I dealt with um, many issues in terms of learning. Students who had been marginalized or pushed out of the system. Um, I dealt with addictions. I dealt with mental health issues. Uh, it was a very, very interesting and rewarding time. I was welcomed into the tribe and into the community. And from there, I had won an Excellence in Teaching Award um, by our government. And a, <coughs> a sheikh from the Middle East was going around the world looking at Commonwealth countries, Australia, Britain, New Zealand, and Canada. And he hired me to go teach in the Middle East. So I went to Dubai for five years and worked with a submarine commander from England, a physicist from Baghdad. I'm a ranch kid. <laughs> and I was teaching academic English at Dubai Men's College for five years. So that was a very interesting and formative experience in the mid-1990s. And in 1995, when I had arrived, or 1990, yeah, 1995 when I arrived, the first day I got there, these are my students, Badr and Ahmed, on either side. And Badr said to me, Sir, 
Are you going to join us for the video conference with the NASA engineers at 4 o'clock? I mean, this is 1995. So in my world, all of a sudden, I recognized how technology was reshaping classrooms and extending relationships and reaching out to the world. So I did a master's degree in the mid-1990s, um, looking at how we connect on the internet. And you have to remember that that was a really early time. I was one of the first 200 people on Skype. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many millions of dollars I've lost in not investing in all of these things. <laughs> but I've learned that really, even now, we're in the early days of technology, the Model T stage of, you know, the very, very beginning of where things are going. And this afternoon, I'll give you a little bit more detail. But from Dubai, I went back to Alberta. I worked in the high schools, in the public system for two years in a city. Uh, I then went to the government and was an advisor to the Minister of Education, went to the university, taught in the graduate programs, and then six years ago joined the Alberta Teachers Association and uh, am enjoying my work uh, immensely. This presentation, if you go to philmccray.com, you can get at the very under presentations, you'll get a summary of the key ideas. And I believe that I'll leave this with Oyvind and Roar and your president so you can share it with others. So you don't have to madly scramble and write everything. Um, I'll make sure that you have a copy of this. And if you're on Twitter, feel free to tweet away. My username is Phil McRae. So in this presentation, in the next 52 minutes and 10 seconds, I'm going to talk about three things. The first is the context that we're living in in North America, but really we're all living in around education around the world. The second thing is I'm going to share with you some research on school principals that we just did. It's a national study. My colleague, Dr. J.C. Couture, and one of our principals, Gene Stiles, are here with us. We embarked upon this study two years ago, and it's the largest study of school principals in Canada. And I'm going to share with you the six key findings, what we heard from them. And then I'm going to ask you to tell me, does this sound like it's similar to you? Is it different, right, to share some of the things? And then finally, at the very end, I'm going to say, how do we move forward, hopefully, with what the school principals told us, with the changing context, how do we live in schools and create great schools for all? Sound good? Because if not, I'm going back to Canada. So. <laughs> all right, so the context. Um, I've just come back from... Qatar. I was at the World Innovation Summit. And one of the things that I've learned increasingly as I'm traveling around the world is that transformation in education systems is everywhere. Language is similar. Personalization, language about technology, digital citizenship, um, reforms, all of these things are happening all over the world. And really, what I'm noticing is many of these reforms some of them good, some of them bad, are being taken up by policymakers and politicians very quickly, and in some cases without some deep thought. So it's important that we have a chance to really think about those changes. Two years ago, I was at a meeting of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development on Innovative Learning Environments. So this was senior policymakers from 43 countries around the world, and at that time, uh, the president of the ATA were, was there representing the teachers. And they talked for two days about the following three things. This is what, what I heard over and over and over. Innovative learning environments and schools of the future will be about choice, personalization, and flexibility. And they kept talking about all of these great transformational changes that would happen. So the first night when I went back, I thought, what are they talking about when they say choice? Is it school choice, private, public, online, offline? Is it personalization as in the individual gets what they want? And is flexibility about curriculum? Is it about, you know, what are they talking about? So the next morning when I went back to that meeting, I asked the group at the plenary, help me understand what choice means. What do you really mean by choice? And what is personalization? And what is this flexibility? And it was like ostriches. Heads went under the sand. Nobody had a clue. Nobody had it. Senior policymakers. This is how the world would unfold. And, you know, that made my eye twitch and my hair start to go gray. 
because I realized that transformation is an unwritten book, an undiscovered country where a lot of people are giving rhetoric or talk and they really don't understand what they're talking about. So being the curious ranch kid, I got a camera and I started to figure out why was this the spirit of the group? Why was this what people were talking about for two days in terms of the future schools that we would see around the world? And again, there was representation from all over the world, including across Scandinavia. So in North America, we have Walmarts. And in a Walmart, you can go in and you can buy any one of 10 different types of oranges, 15 types of gluten-free bread, 20 different versions of yogurt. And once you take it off the shelf and buy it, they put it back on just like that. So over 100,000 items in stock, 24 hours a day in many places, 365 days a year. And in my uh, province, my father, who's 85 this year, if he had an orange at Christmas, that was a big deal when he was growing up. Our young people now have 18 different types of oranges, 10 different types of gluten bread, 20 different types of yogurt. Choice in terms of food is a very common thing now for many of our young people. This is the average food supply of a North American family for one week, and it really freaks me out. <laughs> if you take a look at the nutritional value, it's scary, but this is the food supply of a North American family for one week. And actually, if you look at that, there's a lot of variety of different foods that they have access to. So when I heard people talk about choice, it actually was because many people in OECD countries live in more affluence. We do have more choice. There is more of this happening. But my experience around the world has taught me that not everyone has choice. So even though we talk about food choice, we know that in Alberta, one in seven of our children lives in poverty. And Alberta is very much like Norway. We're, we're considered the 10th wealthiest place on the planet at any given time. We have about 11 trillion Canadian dollars in oil and gas revenue. So that's about $2 million per man, woman, and child. Yet, yet, one in seven of our children lives in poverty in Alberta. They don't have food security. So, I mean, there's a lot we can learn from you when we visited schools yesterday. And, you know, your young people and... The, a lot of how you take care of, of young people is something that we need to remember. So people have choice, but not everyone has choice. So I'm walking around with my camera and I'm thinking about choice, personalization, and flexibility. And I'm thinking, where is this coming from again? Do you guys know what Baskin and Robbins? Do you have Baskin and Robbins? It's an ice cream, right? You go into any uh, airport in North America, you'll find these ice cream places, Baskin and Robbins ice cream. And in 1951, their marketing was they had 31 flavors of ice cream. So if I asked you to take a pen and write down 31 flavors, it'd be pretty hard to do, right? All right, so here's my question. In 2014, how many flavors of Baskin and Robbins ice cream are there? Take a guess, if you didn't see that. How many flavors? It's like an auction, you have to guess. 30? 30? Well, they're going down one? 30? Okay. What? 90? In 2014, there are over a thousand flavors of Baskin and Robbins ice cream. You could get a cherry chocolate jalapeno ice cream delivered to your house. I'm thinking diabetic coma. I went to do a keynote in one of our northern cities and they put me in a Radisson. Now, who stayed in a Radisson recently? Okay, I don't know if you have this, but I'm curious. I came into the Radisson and they had sitting on the bed a little wand and a card. And the card said, have a great night, find your personal sleep number, right? So I wasted two hours of my life <laughs> looking for my personal sleep number in the drawer, under the pillow, you know. Of course, being a man, I didn't read the directions. I turned the card over and it says, you know, take this one, zero, soft, 99, hard, you know, find your personal sleep number. I then wasted another two hours of my life 
trying to figure out my sleep number, and I had the worst sleep ever. <laughs> but this is interesting, you know, your personal sleep number. And what's also very interesting is on the back it says, helpful hint, try our most popular sleep number, 35. <laughs> so it's like standardized personalization. <laughs> our young people, they have access to technologies and content like we've never seen before. Personal video recorders or digital video recorders, 80 hours of flexible viewing, anytime, any place. I can watch a live hockey game, I can pause it, go get something to eat, come back, record it. I can have that sent to my phone, to my iPad, to my television, my game system. It's spread across. Rogers Any Place TV. This is a company in Canada that advertises Any Place TV. Our newspaper in Edmonton, your Edmonton Journal, anytime, anywhere. You can get it wherever you are, including Stavanger, at 2.30 in the morning when you have jet lag. <laughs> McDonald's, any lane, anytime. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I took this picture and I'm like, what does that mean? But you can see the marketing, any place, any time, anywhere, any lane, right? And I could put a hundred slides up for you about choice, personalization, and flexibility as consumers in our society. Any airline, any flight, any time, the Royal Bank of Canada, this is one of their advertisements. Well, what do you think happened with education policy? In 2010, guess what started to appear in the language of our education policy? Students need to be engaged in multiple ways to create new learning possibilities that are available. Are you ready for it? <laughs> Anywhere, anytime, any place, and at any pace. Now, the person who wrote that was a former graduate student of mine. He was an executive director. So he wanted to have lunch and talk about this. And I said, I want to have lunch and talk about this. Because our daughter was in grade two at the time. And I said, what are you talking about? When it's 40 degrees Celsius below in the winter, she's going to learn anywhere, any place, any time. You know, and by the time we finished our salad, he said, Dr. Phil, we need help. I need your help. And I said, well, don't put it in the business plan until you know what it is. <laughs> so what's happened is, this choice, personalization, and flexibility has appeared everywhere in our language increasingly. It's about control, what I learn, how I learn, where I learn it. And what really concerns me about choice, personalization, and flexibility is when it moves to be just about the individual, right? Individual control or individuality becoming this new conformity. And young people are under a lot of pressure too, by the way, around choice and around being original and individuality. And we're seeing our anxiety and depression in 12 million adolescents, a, a research study of 12 million adolescents in North America. Anxiety and depression is skyrocketing. A lot of it because of the anxiety created by all of this choice, personalization, and flexibility. Now I'm gonna ask you to turn to somebody sitting beside you, and I want you to think of examples where modern services, products, or experiences in Norway have been personalized or customized just for you, okay? Take five minutes and think of an example. It could be the Starbucks coffee, it could be whatever, but I want you to think of some examples and share it with somebody sitting at your table, okay? Five minutes. Okay. If I can get your attention. Oyvind, do we have a microphone? Is there a mic? I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to share with others, and it can be in Norwegian, no problem. You can speak in Norwegian, but share some examples of services, products, or experiences, either in English or Norwegian, that you have been, uh, you've seen personalized or customized just for you. Does anybody have an, an interesting example they might want to share? Something? Okay, we have one over there. While we're getting the mic, 
I had, I've done this with a group of 2,000 people when I was doing a keynote. And somebody went up to the mic, and this is the truth, at least according to them. They had their couch made in a customized way in their basement with a 3D printer. And I'm like, what? You know, what's happening? Okay, we have an example. Um, we were talking, uh, talking about Facebook. Yeah. How they, if you push the like button or if you go into, you like a page or whatever, yeah. it will customize the advertising towards it, what you have been liking. Yeah. The algorithm basically maps your habits yeah. and then gives you this personalized advertising feedback. Yeah. And also, we're just talking about different shops here in Norway, like Coop. And mm -hmm. Los and different places where you go shopping and you have a card, and they will register uh, what you've been buying, mm -hmm. and then you will receive coupons mm -hmm. um, to go and get that product because they notice that you've been buying that a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. Th this tracking and of habits. Actually, there's a new app for our phones in uh, Canada mm -hmm. where when you go down the aisle. It will register the food and give you coupons on your phone as you go down. I know. Yeah. So guess who's doing all the coupons? All the really bad food companies, right? Uh, another example? Somebody else have something? Yep. Oh, just grab another one. Yeah, right here, just so we can. Uh, English? Uh, no, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, we, we, we talked about the going to the grocery store. Um, yeah. Now you can make a profile at the, at the grocery store and, it, and the, the shop makes the, the, the shop based on the shop you can pick up the, 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 the groceries at the, at the dropping point based on your history and uh, buying at the store. Yeah. So it's all uh, registered what you're buying during a month or a year. Can you get it dropped off at home? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Wow. Crazy, thank you. So we live in this world where our young people and ourselves are getting things that are more customized, greater choice and increased flexibility. But there's a great book by Renata Sletchel called The Tyranny of Choice. And I would encourage you to read it. She's a sociologist from Eastern Europe. And as Eastern Europe democratized and opened up, she wrote this book about what it did to the society. And she talked about the rise of anxiety because of choice. And she said, there's anxiety because of increased choice for three particular reasons. This is important for the health of our young people and in many ways for us. The first thing she said is, choice is always social, right? What kind of breakfast did you get? What, are you wear what shoes are you wearing today, right? What kind of thing? I mean, people are constantly making choices based on people around them. We follow others. The second thing is, we try to make the perfect choice, right? Did I get the right cell phone, cell phone plan? Did I order the right latte? Did I get the right mate on, you know, uh, eBay, whatever? I mean, the, you know, we have all these dating sites. Did I pick the perfect wife? Yeah. Okay, I'm, just because it's recorded, I didn't meet my wife online. <laughs> We try to make perfect choices, but guess what? There are no perfect choices. So it creates a certain amount of anxiety. And the third is, every time you pick this gluten-free bread, you don't pick this gluten bread. And that choice creates anxiety because you involve a loss. You try and get one thing and you don't. So we live in this world now of choice, personalization, and flexibility. And I understand why now. This was the spirit of that group. But if I were to go back in time, two years, I would say to the group the next morning, instead of what does choice, personalization, and flexibility mean, every time we talk about choice, we need to talk about equity. Every time we talk about personalization, what I want, when I want, how I want it, we need to talk about the needs of the community, the role of the collective. And every time I talk about flexibility, whether it's curriculum or school or access to learning, I also need to talk about responsibility. The ability to respond. Responsibility, the ability to be able to respond. 
Do I have the skills? Am I self-directed as a learner? Can I self-regulate it? All of these other kinds of things. And what's interesting about all of these on a policy continuum is there's always a trade-off. You can't have choice and still have equity. You have to, you have to make a, a, a decision of where you're going to be. And we need to really think carefully about equity, as I'll share with you in the next part of this presentation. So research. We did a national study, the largest national study of principles in Canada. And in this study, we did both surveys and focus groups. And it represented, when we looked at the demographics, the profile of our principles, it was very accurate to who our principles were in terms of representing their voice in Canada. So I'm very interested as school leaders if this is similar to your experiences. So I'm going to be watching your eyes and your head to see if this resonates with you. This is Canada, our country. You can see the darker colors are where there's larger populations. So we had representation from every province and territory in the country. Ontario, uh, we have a representative, Lindy, from Ontario. That's where we have our greatest populations. There's Alberta pulled out, and we actually oversampled our Alberta population because we wanted to have really good de details on how our principals in Alberta were feeling. And in Alberta, our principals and teachers are together in the same union, in the same profession. Here's the first finding that they told us across Canada. The diversity of students in our schools and in our classrooms is increasing. And here's their voice. The social and emotional needs of students are high. The stress of home dynamics come into the school. A team approach must be in place. Wraparound services are a must. What they're telling us is that in the last five to 10 years in Canada especially, the ethnic, the linguistic, behavior, and social and emotional needs of students has really increased. The complexity of what a classroom looks like in Alberta is fundamentally different than a classroom even five years ago. In our city, Calgary, where the stampede takes place, I don't know if you've heard of the Calgary stampede, but in that city of a million people, they went from a 5% English language learner student population to 29% in four years. Think of that. Imagine your schools going from 5% English language learners, or sorry, uh, second language learners, Norwegian second language learners, to 29% just like that in four years. That's the kind of diversity that we're seeing in our province and across Canada. The second thing that they said is happening is the family is changing. The family context is changing. There's been a dramatic change in parental expectations of schools in terms of or in relation to raising children. Far more frequent and regular contact and parents who believe schools are responsible for everything from fitness to moral education. We call it hyper parenting, right? The teacher puts the mark up at three o'clock and the parent looks at it at 301. I mean, there, there's this hyper parenting. The rights of the one have eroded the rights of the many. This is a, a principal's voice, a, a school leader's voice. The rights of one have eroded the rights of many. When the discussion turns to education of students with special needs, both the gifted and the challenged. So that's that individualism that's coming out. What's really interesting, I sit on another board, the Norlean Foundation's innovation team. And it's an, a mental health, large kind of early learning group. And they just released research that said childhood abuse is no longer the biggest issue in North America. It's actually childhood neglect, which is even a bigger thing, that people are working longer hours, the middle class is shrinking, kids are put in front of TVs or iPads for longer and longer periods of time. So as much as we have hyper-parenting, we also have a lot more neglect happening with our young people. And this is creating huge dynamic shifts. What a, what a family looks like, blended, single parent, uh, multi-parent. I mean, there's all kinds of different changes in terms of family complexity. The third thing that they told us of six different things is teaching and learning conditions. Schools are expected to be all things to all people. Choice, 
personalization, flexibility, customization. This pressure is really, really being felt in schools. Increasing government demands to quantify student achievement forces a school-wide focus on numbers, not learning. Right? How are my kids doing? Are they a 7? Are they a 7.34689? Are they a, you know, where are they? I, I, have, I hate to say it, but I live in a community where they're all um, middle class, but many of them are doctors. And, you know, I, this actually happened to the kindergarten teacher at our local community school. Two parents came in after the first two weeks of kindergarten, and they said, will our child go to Harvard? <laughs> and they meant it. Yeah, that's why we're moving to Norway. The goals are misplaced. We should be raising a generation that is creative and brave. I love that, right? That's the voice of the school leader. The, the, the goals are misplaced on focusing on numbers and achievement. We should be raising a generation that is creative and brave. Brave. I would have had one more thing, which is resilient, that has the ability to bounce back from adversity. This is what teachers increasingly feel like <laughs> across the country. Not that those are our teachers, I'm just saying, that's how they feel, right? That there's this load that so much is happening, they can't even move forward, right? Because of the weight of the bureaucracy and the assessments and all of these other expectations on their teaching practice. We've been using Dr. Andy Hargraves and Dr. Michael Fullen's book, Professional Capital. If you haven't read it, it, it's an excellent book about the profession and listening to your president reading her speech, clearly these are shared values about what does it mean to be a professional and how can we get there when we're living under these kinds of conditions. Many of our female principals said, we can't even go to the washroom. We don't even have time in the day to take a break because they're covering things. It used to be that people would eat lunch together. That's a very rare thing now increasingly in different schools across the country that people can't even sit down and eat lunch together because they're tutoring students at lunch or they're on some kind of duty or they're marking. You know, this is what's happening and it's not good for the culture. Principals also can't take these complex conditions and feel like they can be omnicompetent. Have you ever heard of this? It's by a researcher named Carmichael. The all-wise, all-knowing leader doesn't exist, never did. Right? Superwoman, Superman doesn't exist. Especially when the teaching and learning conditions are more complex. We need to see shared leadership. And that's what we've been working on a great deal within our profession in Alberta, is how do we talk about school leadership across the school? So it's not just the principal that's seen as the leader, but there are leaders across the school uh, throughout the year. 95% of principals in Canada, Canada want to spend more time in classrooms with teachers. Yet, in their week, of 56 hours a week, that's the work week, or 62 actually for a principal, 60, 56 to 62 hours a week, they spend 4.7, I'm not sure where we get the 0.7, but 4.7 hours per week spent on instructional um, leadership activities. So it's really important that we think of our, our principals as instructional leaders, not just managers, not just people who facilitate the work of the plant, the school, but about the instructional leadership and being present there as the pedagogue, the first among equals in a school. The fourth finding was technology, which I'll talk about after lunch, a lot of. But here's what we heard. I am constantly working to keep pace with change and also to help my teachers embrace new practices. I hope it will deepen community, but fear it may isolate both educators and students. I am spending a lot of time trying to educate parents, staff, and students as to what constitutes bullying and what is normal social conflict. We will need to include education on bullying on an ongoing basis. So Facebook, Twitter, social media, digital technologies are really increasing pressures around cyberbullying and what's happening. So a lot of our principals are saying technology gives and it takes away. It has promise and it has peril. It's a paradox. And that is a struggle that we will live with, as you'll hear this afternoon, 
for all time because it gives and it takes away many things. The school leader's paradox, however, is this in Canada. Be an agent of innovation and transformation, but don't unsettle those resistant to change. Right? So the school leader's paradox around innovation and transformation and being seen as the leader, it's a huge pressure. Are you a 21st century school? Is this, you know, is this the way you're moving forward? Even though we are a decade into the 21st century and I don't know what that means. The economy was the fifth thing that principals told us. The current economic downfall, so after 2008 in Canada, had a tremendous effect on communities and families. This increases the stress level for families and also results in challenges to provide needed resources to support children. So when the economy takes a shock or a shift, that has huge implications to the school and the school culture. It's very hard to get students interested in graduating in our area. This is a quote from Alberta, where a student at 17 or 16 can leave school and make $150,000 Canadian, sweeping a floor in northern Alberta in a shop, right? I mean, it's an incredible issue with some of our schools uh, where we didn't have this. So it's hard to get students interested in graduating because of good wages in the oil field. In time, this may level out as the resources are depleted, but may come too late. Then what do you do with 40 to 50 year olds with no education? Right? So the economy and its challenges is an interesting one. OECD, when they did their PISA report, talked about excellence is achieved through equity. How many of you know Dr. Pasi Salberg from Finland? Okay, he, he's a good friend of ours and his work, he often speaks about excellence in education can only be achieved if you really focus on equity. And this is really important because around the world, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Right? This is happening. We're seeing it statistically. It's called the Matthew effect. 1% of the wealthiest in North America own 50% of all the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom half of North America, the bottom 50% of the population, owns 0.5% of the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The inequality is absolutely exploding. The average CEO of the Standard & Poor 500, so this is an international benchmark, make 380 times the average age of the worker, standard worker. So as a principal, take your calculator, put your salary in, times it by 380, and give your teacher you know, the average salary, and then you take 380 times that salary. How long would you survive in your school, right? In 1980, the difference was 42 times. So the gap, the inequality, is exploding around the world. And the only way you can stop that is through policies and considering what that looks like. I was at a meeting of our government in Alberta, and they talked about the future of learning resources. And I don't know if you can see this slide, but on one side, these are print materials, and on the other side, they're digital. And they said, over time, we're going to go from print to digital. That's what was happening, right? We see this already starting to occur. And what's interesting is that today and tomorrow, this is where the government is spending a lot of their money, cost to governments now. And over here, it's increasingly cost to families. So guess what happens over time? The cost to government drops on learning resources and increases for families. So we see this with bring your own device in schools, right? Bring your own technology. We have kids who can bring an iPad, a phone, uh, something else, and other kids who don't even have breakfast in the morning in the same school. So the inequalities are exploding. And when I talked about this slide that government had put together in terms not of, you know, look at how we're moving to digital technologies, but more about what are the costs to families, uh, they quickly took down the slide. What we know from a really good body of research by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett is children do better at school in more equitable societies. I would encourage you to look at this research. We heard it at the Stockholm Summit about four years ago and it's been very popular. How many of you know Wilkinson and Pickett's work? It's called the spirit level. But here's what their research looks like. 
they did 30 years of data of countries all over the world. And what they said is, if this is high income inequality, right, the gap between a kindergarten teacher making $40,000 and a surgeon making $800,000, which actually exists in New York, if there's a high income inequality, you're up here, or sorry, high income inequality, you're up here. And on this one, he looked at different things. In this one, he looked at children's experience of conflict. So things like bullying, fighting, etc. Well, first of all, Canada sits right in the middle on this graph of income inequality. Norway is right here. You guys, in their research, are doing really well on keeping your inequality gaps lower, which also means you're keeping your experiences of conflict and bullying lower. But look up here. As you move up to higher inequality, you get higher incidence of issues. And he went through all kinds of things, obesity, imprisonment rates, um, uh, teenage birth, a whole set of measures. And what you find is that your social and health outcomes get worse the higher your income inequalities right? go. And this is really important. So I asked Professor Wilkinson, the latest data in Canada that you have, are we moving this way or are we moving this way? Where do you think we're going? We're going to greater in, in income inequality. And actually, it's just as I got on the airplane out of Canada to fly here, on the national news, inequality is being ranked now one of the greatest threats to our country because it will impact everything in terms of health care, social outcomes, etc. So we really need to think about this going on. One of the greatest challenges is going to be between urban and rural. I wish I'd had the Oslo skyline, your barcode. Right? I didn't do it, but I wanted to put you know, one up there. But the urban and the rural, the rurals don't have, the urbans have. So the, the inequality now between the urban and rural is something that we're taking a very close look at. Six and final finding is the social and cultural influences. These are one of the other big impacts principles say. School is not a building, but a community connected to others in a complex web. Right? School is not a building of brick and mortar, but school is a complex, deeply interconnected web of community. That's, that's really what a school is. Right? School doesn't exist except for you, your teachers, parents, and that community. Right? The idea of a system is an imaginary. It's really where it lives. We need government leaders who respect and value education and see educators as professionals if we're going to keep new teachers in the profession. Very strong finding in terms of where we want to go. So here's my question. I want you to take another three or four minutes, and I want you to say, what would you have said to us in that research in terms of opportunities and challenges? Would you have talked about diversity of students, Increasing complexity of families, social and cultural issues, technology. What kinds of things would you have talked about? What would you have said in terms of the role of the principal and kind of where things were going? So I'll just ask you to take a few minutes and talk about that. Okay. If I can get your attention... So I want to finish it, um, and I'm between you and food, which is a very dangerous place to be, between you and lunch. So I need to try and keep, I'll be about five minutes over, but I want to wrap it up. Just a question, looking in the room, how many of you could see your experience or your voice in those findings? If you can just put your hand up so I can see. How many of you in this room see your voice or experience? Could hold them up high so I can see. So a vast majority. Okay, that's good because it really, t this speaks of globalization. This speaks of the forces that are affecting all of us, whether they be technology or the economy or relationships or identity. All of these things are affecting, uh, affecting all of us. So what about the imperatives, the future? What did the principles say they wanted? Okay, and then I'm going to leave you with what I think we also need to have before lunch. 
So they really were hopeful because I think in the profession of teaching, we have to be hopeful, right? You don't go into a school and if you're not hopeful and optimistic. And so they were really hopeful. How do we move forward? One of the things that's clear for us in the profession is that if you believe you don't have power, you won't have power. This is a quote by Alice Walker, the lady who wrote The Color Purple. The most common way people give up their power is by believing they don't have any. And I think that's really important. We must believe that we can affect positive change going forward in a much more complex and volatile and uncertain world. So they said we need to teach and learn for greater diversity. We need to have more flexible curriculum, which I know you have more flexible curriculum in Norway. We had a chance to see that. But we are much more constrained across Canada and in Alberta. Create integrated service model with supportive governments. Where are the psychiatrists and the mental health professionals and the supports and the school nurse? They need to be in place to support the greater diversity. And they said, let's use technology to enhance and engage student learning. But let's do it with a consistent technology infrastructure to bridge this inequity, the, the digital divide. So it's like we want to use technology to meet diversity, but don't just say bring your own device and leave it up to some who can and some who can't, right? The second thing is, they said we need to collaborate and build the professional capacities for our staff. Create more time and space during the school day for professional collaboration, for professional learning. We need it during the day, not on Saturday, not at 8 o'clock at night, but during the day. And establish mentorship programs, people that we can work with, that we can look up to. And by the way, just pairing somebody in mentorship doesn't mean you have mentorship. You have to get the right person, right? That confidant, that friend, that confederate that you can be mentored by. And we need to encourage and facilitate professional growth, professional development. This was actually when they talked about immediate needs. 66% of them said we need greater PD for teachers. Political vision and commitment was the next one. Leadership capacity building, so their own professional growth. More specialists in schools was 57%. Community partnerships, and then 46% was increased funding to schools. These were the short and, short and long-term needs that they identified. But teacher PD, building capacities, was their largest immediate need. The third, they said, let's build family and community relationships. We need to engage everybody to support student learning. Right? We need to engage everybody. The people who don't have children in schools, the people who do have children in schools, the person who's in charge of the county, the, you know, all of these people need to be engaged. Introduce wraparound services with specialists in schools. So we call them wraparound services. Is it similar language here? Right? Basically, we need more people in schools to support. And foster meaningful conversations between schools, parents, and students. One of the big things in our schools, and Jean Stiles, the principal of a school of 2,500 students, who's here if you have a chance to talk to her, student voice is really important. Hearing from students and some of their visions, as well, of course, as the profession uh, and, and having the vision of, of parents, teachers, uh, and, but students is something that's happening a lot. And the fourth and final vision is let's promote continuous leadership learning. Engage in leadership development programs. Tell me how to be a le leader in a digital age. What does that look like with technologies as they're reshaping our society and ourselves? Disseminate information to staff with support of the school district or the, the region. And share promising practices. Hey, my school went from 4% or 5% second language learners to 29%. And here's what I did, and it worked. It may work or it may not work for you, but sharing those practices helps to create this lateral capacity building, this ability across the system for people to learn from each other. Because when I look at a room like this, you are the wisdom. Nobody's coming to save us. You are the wisdom in terms of how you can help each other learn. And so how do you create those mentorship programs? 
Um, and then finally, the technology one, I'm going to tell you that after. But here's my last note for lunch. <laughs> avoid the distractions, right? I mean, avoid the distractions. Because there are a thousand people knocking at the door of your school to tell you how and what you should do, right? But you know what is not a distraction? Relationships, relationships, relationships. The core of our pedagogic work, the core of our foundation of social construction of learning. Relationships are the thing that creates community, that builds resilience, that holds our school together, and that is not a distraction. Having the latest and greatest technology and having a PhD in emerging technologies, I can tell you for years I've heard a lot about the great things that will happen. Sure, but that's not what it's about. It's about relationships. And really, these are our kids. That's Morgan, and that's Duncan in our backyard. You can tell it has a Scottish tint to it. But Morgan and Duncan are really the moral imperative of our work. Every day, parents send their children to your schools. It's, for us, the greatest treasure we have, the greatest resource we have. And the work of a school has a moral imperative to help one generation move into the next. So when we talk about creating a great school for all, it is really about the relationships between students, with students, with parents, and within the community. That's the core of our work. So there's my email. <laughs> and nothing new under the sun, I'm sure. Um, but we're going to lunch. And again, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, we've really enjoyed the very short time we've been here um, so far. And it is a beautiful country. Um, Vokitland Vakre Miniska.